Hi, my name is Hui Wen Sato, and I'm here to talk about the loss of health and life in my pediatric patients as a nurse. That's Wei Wen. We're Chris and Claire, and this is the Silent Why podcast. Welcome. We're a childless married couple on a mission to see if hope can be found in every type of permanent loss. We've set a target of 101 losses, and this is number 34. In this episode, we'll introduce you to Wei Wen Sato from California, who works as a pediatric intensive care nurse at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. There are these situations where you, you're seeing the, the worst tragedies, and all you want to do is go and help. And you realize that this is not a normal thing for most people and that that in and of itself seems to mean something. It doesn't push me away. Wei Wen has experienced loss many times through her work and has a really interesting take on grief as part of her career, much like murder detective Steve Keogh in episode 33. I first encountered her through a TEDx talk that she gave titled How Grief Helped Me Become a Better Caregiver. As you can imagine, once I heard that, I just had to reach out to see if she'd chat to us. And being the lovely caregiver she is, she said yes. Hooray! It's not because I'm drawn to these really dark things. I'm so fascinated by sort of the human experience and the depth of what people can go through and yet how they work through it and sort of come out of it. In many of our conversations, we talk about permanent loss on a sudden and shocking scale. But what's it like working in a job where you know loss is coming? where you expect it, where you're paid to expertly prepare for it and comfort others through it, and all that with children. If I come in and I meet a a family where, you know, they're in the most human and vulnerable point of their lives, I, I don't come in as a robot. I come in as somebody who has to really feel out on a deeply human level. So lean into everything Wei Wen has to say. She speaks so beautifully about the light that can be found in the darkest of places. And we started off our chat by asking her to introduce herself and what a normal week looks like for her. My name is Hui Wen Sato. I am a pediatric ICU nurse. I work in Los Angeles, California. And a typical week for me, I work part-time, which means I just work two 12-hour shifts a week. I happen to work every Monday and Saturday. So I also have two um, young elementary age girls. So the other days of the week, uh, I am home managing the kids and the household. Um, But with work, we are in a pediatric ICU. uh, And that means that we get patients anywhere from two weeks old to sometimes 18 years, even upwards to 21, 22 years if they've been followed in our hospital for a long time. Um, They can be patients who just need uh, one-on-one, or we can have a maximum of two patients at any given time. And they're patients who just need uh, much more intense, focused nursing care and attention. And so it's a very, very broad range of patients. It can be anything from post-operative liver transplant, kidney transplants, to patients with cancer who have developed really bad infections. Um, They can be victims of traumas, so really bad car accidents. You know, we're pediatrics, and so we had stories of kids who got adventurous and climbed out a second-story window and didn't realize that that wasn't a good idea. Uh, We can have patients who are um, attempted suicides, um, victims of abuse from others, gunshot wounds, drowners. It, It can be quite the array of patients. And so anytime we go into work, it's always different. Have you always worked in pediatrics? Is that quite a new thing? Or have you been in other areas of care as well? I am actually a second career nurse. And so, uh, When I became a nurse, I did immediately start in pediatrics, uh, which was a surprise to me. I I thought I was going to be working with adults. I'm kind of an old soul, and so I didn't think I was quite playful enough for kids. But I think the ICU ended up being a really good fit for me because it is uh, a lot more focused, in-depth, sadly sometimes or a lot of times much more serious. And we spend so much of our time actually caring for the parents as well, which um, can be both really rewarding and really challenging. But prior to becoming a nurse, I actually worked in um, long-term care facilities with the frail elderly. 
<laughs> we did a lot of kind of nursing assistant type research interventions. And then when I became a nurse, ended up in pediatrics. But I've been in pediatrics since the beginning of nursing, and I've been there for almost 12 years. I have so many questions. <laughs> My brain's just like, how far do people come to this hospital? Could you have a two-week-old and an 18-year-old? How do you know which one you're going to get each day? It's like uh, the variety of what you must encounter. Give us an idea of how long you might be with, if you've got two patients, is it likely that you're coming in for a few weeks having those same patients or could it literally be every week is a, is a change in patient? It can be literally a change in patient. Um, it could be daily. So the way with... The way nursing works is uh, if you work consecutive shifts, they try to give a little bit of consistency to everyone. So if I worked a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I would likely be assigned to the same patients, um, one or two patients um, those few days. But then if I came back to work the following Saturday, I would get a totally different patient assignment. There are times when we do actually sign ourselves up to be a primary nurse for a patient that we recognize is going to be in our unit for a very long time. Maybe they have very specific nuances to their care or the family dynamics where they would just really benefit from nurses who every time the nurses come to work, they're always with the same patient. And it gives everyone a lot of extra uh, consistency, familiarity, extra trust. And the nurses can advocate better for their patients that way when they just really know the ins and outs of what they need. I don't want to assume anything, but I'm, I'm imagining because it's intensive care that most of the time the patients, the children that you're with are not in maybe a conscious state or they're, uh, you know, it's, it's quite severe and quite serious care as opposed to just life on a, a normal ward. Would that be right? Yeah, I would say... More than half of the patients probably would be either sedated because of the different medical interventions they have where we need them to not be fighting, having a breathing tube, you know, in their mouth or just other therapies where we just really need their bodies to rest and not use energy to fight everything. And there are some patients who are alert and awake. <laughs> we kind of make a joke, you know, if we see them playing on their little iPhone or iPad, then they're stable enough to go to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> if they're talking and giving us sass, then they're ready to go out of the ICU. <laughs> it's just like when you stay home from school when you're sick and then you get a little bit excited and run around and your mum's like, right, you're going back. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, there are some too who um, sadly... It's not even because of them being on sedation medications, but they might just be so, so very sick um, that they've really kind of lost consciousness or responsiveness. And it can be quite the variety of levels of engagement, I would say, with our patients. Over the years, I've, I've grasped an appreciation for why people would do this kind of work because my mum was a pediatric nurse. But I'd imagine a lot of people would look at this and just think, oh, sick people's hard enough. Really sick people is, is, is even harder. And then you, you put children in the mix and, and that's just, I don't, I don't know how you, how you do that. So what are the reasons that you enjoy doing this and, and what kind of brought you into that kind of work? I remember reading this poem once. It was a, a nurse who wrote about the experience of a nursing student who saw an emergency happen in the hospital. And, and it's this very dramatic scene where the patient is really kind of decompensating. And you're reading this story and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this just sounds so terrible and overwhelming. And the closing line of the poem says, let this be my life's work. Let this be my life's work. And it's this really striking, strange pull, I think, of it's not just adrenaline seeking, you know, but it, I think seeing that there are these situations where you just you're you're seeing the, the worst tragedies and the worst illnesses and the worst circumstances hit people and all you want to do is go and help. And you realize that this is not a normal thing for most people and that that in and of itself seems to mean something. It doesn't push me away and I, I want to go and do something and I, I have this something in me that can go to it and wants to learn what I can do. And I think we also recognize that because these patients and their families are where they are, they shouldn't have to go through all of that alone and that if there are people who can be there, can be present without panicking, feeling utterly overwhelmed by it, that 
we've got to go to them. We've got to do what we can for them. I understand that. Um, not with physically sick people. I'm not great with that. <laughs> but with people who are going through mental anguish and grief and those sorts of things, I totally see the pull of if you can do something, then there's that kind of, I want to, I want to learn, I want to help. And, and I think you're right. I've learned myself. That's not a normal reaction for a lot of people. Before you were a nurse, had you experienced much sort of loss and grief at all? Or was that your sort of first encounter with that kind of area of life? Yeah, I think I've, I've always been kind of an old soul. <laughs> I've, I've always been this very deep thinker about life and uh, the experiences we have, the good and bad, and um, how people how people get through some of the wild things that they get through. I I remember when I was in college and uh, a guy I was dating at the time, he was noticing all the books I was reading. They were all memoirs and things of people writing about whether whatever it was, you know, journeys with addiction or um, you know attempted suicide or deaths in the family. And they kind of talked about all their journeys. And he just asked me, why are you always <laughs> interested in reading these really sad stories? And I said, no, it's not because I'm drawn to these really dark things. I'm so fascinated by sort of the human experience and the depth of what people can go through and yet how they work through it and find their way and sort of come out of it. And so I was always kind of drawn to those kinds of experiences you know, I've certainly had my my share of personal struggles, as everyone does. Um, but I, I think there was uh, certainly a point in time where someone very close to me had a mental health crisis that eventually became a medical crisis. And I remember going through this person's process of recovery and healing with them and thinking what what I would do if this person hadn't made it, or if this kind of situation repeats itself again, because there was no guarantee to me that this person wouldn't have future crises, that they would be lucky enough to survive like they, like they did this time. And it pushed me to a point where I had to ask myself, why do I still believe that there is reason for my faith in God, reason for hope and belief in goodness in this world, even if this kind of crisis happens again, and it doesn't turn out as favorably as it did this time. And I, I had to wrestle with that very, very deeply, because I knew there wasn't a guarantee that things were all going to turn out perfectly. And I found myself in the midst of my own story of, okay, well, I've read all these other memoirs of people who have been through these really, really big, momentous crises in their lives and they've had to find their way through and now I find myself in the midst of my own and there's something deeper that I I have to find because life is going to go on and I have to figure out how to live it and how to have hope regardless of what happens with this person and I think then seeing that for my patients and their families of realizing that they don't always have a guarantee that things are always going to turn out the way that they want. But still, how do we wrestle hard with that question of what does hope look like? What does the ability to go forward with your life look like when you don't have guarantees of how the future is going to go? One of the clear things that comes to my mind, really, um, and deeper down listening to you talk, is this sort of willingness to prepare for, to ready yourself for what might happen, you know, for the reality that we will all face loss in some form or another. And, and quite often, most often with certainly the podcast, we're talking to people who have reacted to a very sudden or unexpected loss. But you're clearly someone who is willing to consider what could happen and therefore prepare for it do you feel that's that's right for yourself and is that something that doing the job that you do is quite helpful because you are readying yourself to face loss regularly maybe you know there there's this really curious phrase that always gets me when I go to work and I get report on some of my patients so I'll come to work and the, the night shift nurse before me will start sort of the summary of the patient's history and a lot of times you get this phrase that starts with previously healthy, previously healthy three-year-old, previously healthy five-year-old, previously healthy 13-year-old was going about their business doing this or that. And then they were hit by a car. Or they were previously healthy, but then they started having a couple of weeks of dizziness and 
uh, and then they were vomiting and they came in for their symptoms and found that they had, you know, a brain tumor. And there's this very jarring sense of, you know, for me as a mother of young children of this could actually very well be my kids' stories. And it's not to be doomsday about it, but it is to recognize that these were parents who were living their normal lives, just like I live my normal life with my kids. You know, you just go about your business. They started school. I hope they do well. I hope they make friends. And then you were previously healthy. And suddenly there's this interruption that no one sees coming. And I think that I've learned over the years in doing this work that really these things can come at any time and they can come upon all kinds of people, you know, the good and evil of the world. I, the, the variety of experiences can just, can befall anyone and everyone. And I recognize that I'm not immune to that. And so I think it's taught me something about today I have time with my healthy children and I I better make the most out of that. Not, I, I don't always, sometimes they drive me insane and I want them to be in the other room and leave me alone. <laughs> That's a reality too, but it, it teaches me a certain appreciation for the fact that I have them on this mundane day healthy and with me. And, you know, when the pandemic came around, I think there was certainly a stunning vulnerability that we all realized we had right to um, unexpected things and the ways our world can sort of be upended by illness what a, a little tiny virus can do how often would you come across death when you're working with children that are that ill is that is that more common than people would expect or is it quite rare uh, I would say it's actually more common than people might expect I mean, even amongst our our, um, colleagues, you know, I remember one of my managers who was primarily responsible for training our youngest nurses, you know, she would try to warn them, you know, we see a lot of death and dying in our unit and people would say, yeah, yeah, I know it's an ICU. And then they would, you know, be a couple of years in and say, oh, you tried to warn me, but I just didn't even realize how much, how much we actually see. And obviously, because it's children, you're not dealing with just the death of the child. You've also got to deal with grieving parents and people walking through that. And I'm guessing you get that in adults as well. But it feels like there's sort of a more of an intensity to it when you're talking about children and parents. How do you work through that? How do you deal with having to tell parents or, you know, there's really big moments which nobody really wants to be involved in. How, how do you feel about that? Is that also something that you're drawn to because you feel like you can help? Those spaces with the parents really never get easier, I would say. Like when I was with the frail elderly before I became a pediatric nurse, you never want to see anyone lost with pediatrics. There's this sense that they just got started. A little one who's only been in the world for four weeks and suddenly they're teetering on the the edge of life and death. Or, you know, we would get patients who, um, maybe just graduated from high school and they were looking forward to college and making all the plans of just la- launching into adulthood and, you know, tragedy struck and, and all the, all the plan, you know, you see the graduation pictures kind of put up all over the room and you're sort of struck by death doesn't seem like it should be a part of this phase of their life. And who feels that more than the parents, right? Where the parents are, had just built the nursery or who had just started making all the plans to send their kids off to college. So when we meet the parents in this space, there's always a lot of shock and disbelief that they're sitting in. I think that we've learned to just sit in that space with them. And a lot of times I think these parents carry a lot of guilt because they're their children and the parents feel like I should have protected my child better or I should have seen, you know, the signs of illness come on or we shouldn't have gone on that vacation where they got this random infection. Um, There's a lot of guilt and blame that they feel of I was responsible for protecting and taking care of my child and this thing has happened. We sit in that space of shock with them, but I think we also spend a good amount of time trying to reassure them you know, you've been a wonderful parent to your child. And even as we help them through sort of the end of life care, we try to do things that honor their parenthood to their child. So would you like to be a part of bathing your child? You know, if you want to put them in their clothes or do things that help you feel as a parent that you're still doing things to take care of your child, even at the end. 
and show us as even the medical team, this is who my child is, you know, whether it's their outfit or the toy that you put them with, that it's not just a physical being, but this is the life of my child that I want to want to honor at the end. For you to be around that, to work around that, you know, regularly must be an incredible something on you. I'm not sure what that something is. If you were to fill in the missing blank, what what is it like for you working in that environment and having the heart for and giving the time to, but, you know, it is your job and then coming away from work with, with whatever those feelings are? What's it like? I often think of it as sort of flipping between two strange realities. <laughs> You know, there's sort of the world's normal. Uh, you know, I dropped my kids off at school this morning and, you know, had to scold them for taking so long and gathering their things and had to just make sure that they had their sunscreen and their water and all the, the little everyday annoyances of just trying to shepherd them along. You know, and then I flipped to work where, you know, having worked there for 12 years, I, I've gotten fairly accustomed to the kinds of stories and patients we see there. But I might, you know, I might have, you know, a particular patient, like a, a patient who drowned or a patient who was in a car accident, you know, someone who resonates a lot with my own child. And I'm 12 hours in deep. We're the nurses. So we're the closest at the bedside. We're engaging the family the entire 12 hours really sitting in that space moment by moment of all the parents' emotions and then obviously just doing the patient care. And for me, the processing and the emotions of being with that patient and their family, it always comes out the next day. But that becomes really tricky because I work Saturdays and Mondays. And so the next day after work is me flipping back to my normal life. So my mind and heart are still kind of working out all the emotions and thoughts of my patient from the day before. But then I also have my own children in front of me and I'm trying to take care of them. But then I'm still feeling very heavy about the day before. And I think there's a certain disconnect that's always going to be there where my my kids certainly don't understand, you know, what I'm seeing at work or if I'm at church and I'm standing in the courtyard and I'm just watching all the normal kids run around doing normal things and I'm getting emotional and teary-eyed and I'm processing my patient from the day before and I'm very aware that no one else in the courtyard is having this strange kind of out-of-body experience <laughs> of oh my gosh, look how marvelous of a thing it is that healthy children run around a, a church courtyard. You know, no one else is standing there marveling at this, but I'm thinking about my patient and how vulnerable our life is and how quickly loss can come and how sweet these moments are with our kids running around. And, and then someone will come up to me and say, how was your weekend? <laughs> And I just, it, it's very hard to sort of flip back and forth and allow for the tension of the contrast between the two worlds. It sounds like that processing time is really important for you to be able to to kind of think through what you've what you've been through before you go back into it again. So if somebody works in this full time and they are running from it day to day to day, are there different coping strategies for if you, you, you don't get that time out? There are for sure a very, very broad array of coping strategies, and they go from extremely unhealthy to okay to relatively healthier. So certainly on the much less healthy side, you get heavy dependence on alcohol or yeah, mental health issues to just sheer burnout from the intensity of stories without having space to process them or really work through how they affect us. Um, there's certainly um, a lot of forms of depression or anxiety that can kick in. You know, there are certainly people who have found their ways of, I have to be out in nature. I have to just go on long runs and go on vacations, have space from it all. Um, I think we're trying to slowly destigmatize the need for therapy or the value of therapy, I should say. I think the recognition that these things take a toll on us too. You know, I, I think as professional caregivers, there can be a bit of a sense of, well, it's the family's grief. We're, we're doing our job. Or we feel like other people look at us and say, well, this is just your job, right? This is what you sign up for. And the grief belongs to the patient's families, which it primarily does for sure. But 
for us, when we do a job that is this intensely personal, if I come in and I meet a, a family where, you know, they're in the most human and vulnerable point of their lives, I, I don't come in as a robot. I come in as somebody who has to really feel out on a deeply human level what they're feeling, what they need, how do I meet them here and engage them. And so to think of coping as only disconnect, I got to find ways to just disconnect from it, I think shuts out this whole reality of the human experience we have when we engage our patients and family members. And that we also are going to feel their pain and feel the loss of them as people on the periphery, for sure. We're not the patient's parents, but we're still pretty in deep as their caregivers. And so I personally am a very big believer that when we talk about coping, we have to recognize that very, very human aspect of us. And we have to tend to it and acknowledge it rather than, no, it's just my job. I just clock out and try to leave work at work. I don't think it's that simple. With that in mind, and also to summarize, I think what you're saying we hear quite regularly, or you might read when you're in the area of loss and grieving about feeling your feelings, allow yourself to really feel your feelings. So how does it compare being at work to being at home? So when you're with your team and your colleagues, do you collectively acknowledge those feelings or is that something you do privately when you've left the workplace? I feel lucky enough to say I think it's both and. Um, at least in my work environment, I feel that we have a very, very supportive environment with regards to acknowledging the, the emotions and grief of the staff. And so there are a lot of things that they try to build into the hospital to give us space to process that. So it could be some debriefing sessions for staff to just come together. A lot of times those can be facilitated by a chaplain at work or a social worker, and they will meet us with cake and tea and say, you can come in and if you want to talk, you can talk. And if you don't want to talk, but you just want to hug, you can also come in for that. Our managers in our unit are really, really wonderful about trying to create spaces for that when they know we've had either one or two really big losses or just a series of, of heavy cases over time. It, it's still a very fast paced environment. And so the reality is that even, you know, those moments can be very helpful in acknowledging what we're going through at work, but we still have patients we have to take care of. And so a lot of times it's a quick pop in, pop out, 5, 10, 20 minutes maybe. And from there, I think a bulk of the coping and you know, working through our feelings really has to happen more on our own at home. What's your learning journey been like over that 12 years in pediatrics of processing what you see and feel and experience and the emotions at work? What, what's that journey been like to where you are now? I think in the beginning, I, I would look around at all the very experienced nurses and I would just think, everyone just seems so okay <laughs> when they're here at work. Everyone just seems... I'm good. I'm good. No, it's it's kind of intense in there, but I'm good. I'm good. It's changing a bit, but I think the culture generally has been this sense of um, stoicism is to be commended, you know, and you certainly, you have to be able to keep your emotions and yourself in check when you have a patient to take care of and you have to put their needs and the family needs foremost. You can't crumble to the floor trying to support them. But I think in the beginning for me, I certainly went too far in, I think I'm supposed to just always be okay with everything that I see at work, just somehow not be moved by it. And when I started to realize that I, that was not the case, uh, then it it's actually what prompted me to start really asking a lot of questions about why are we so bad at acknowledging our grief as healthcare professionals? Where do we get space to acknowledge this too? For me personally, I started to realize that my emotions would always come out the day after work. And so I would actually feel fine, sort of, at work. I would feel very numb and sober, but not tearful. But it'd always be the next day. And I could be at Target shopping, I could be at the park with my kids, I could be just cleaning the house. And then suddenly I would find myself, you know, on the floor crying. <laughs> and, and as I started to recognize my own rhythms of, oh, this is, this is 
me processing what I'm seeing at work. And I've just stopped fighting that so much. And I've learned to give myself a little more space the day after really difficult shifts to just know, okay, it's probably going to come out today. So I should probably be in a little bit of a quiet, private area. <laughs> Avoid coffee shots if I can. So I don't <laughs> create some really awkward moments. <laughs> when you see the woman crying in the supermarket, it might be a pediatric nurse on her day off. Just yeah, processing. It's okay. Just give her space. It's just her yeah. rhythm. It's okay. <laughs> So how like, because Chris and I have both worked in hospitals and I know one thing we would say is that, you know, a lot of doctors and nurses, maybe more than nurses, I don't know, have a have a kind of cheeky sense of humour. And behind the scenes, you've got the, a bit of a prank culture going on sometimes and stuff. Is that the case when you're working in intensive care? It is. I'm kind of known to be a bit of a prankster at my workplace. Ah. (laughs) And, you know, obviously you have to find the right context. You're not going to do it in front of the room where there's a terrible tragedy, you know, happening. But um, it does provide actually a lot of uh, very, very needed... um, Relief. Yeah, just real. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. And so... Oh, I have so many stories of, you know, I've spiked a coworker's coffee with just obscene amounts of salt. And <laughs> I'm glad you said salt. <laughs> I thought something worse was going to oh, come Oh, I out. mean, it was so great. I had to position myself to make sure I was in front of him when he drank it because I just, I had to see <laughs> how that was going to go down. Um, our managers and I have set up a fake sort of disaster survey for a colleague before, which is very stressful. If you're the charge nurse, you're already trying to run the unit and then you think surveyors are going to come through. We set up a whole fake survey <laughs> to add to his stress for the day. Um, I know of some physician colleagues who they'll This is really bad, but they'll set the sound of the code blue alarm on their phones and then they'll go to their colleague who's trying to get a nap in from being on overnight and then they'll set off the sound and just watch their colleague like fall out of bed (laughs) thinking that there's a real emergency. I mean... (laughs) We're oh, really no. bad, but it's really great. <laughs> Awful. Yeah. You've got to have these ways, like instead of getting the relief, like when we spoke to the, the murder detective, you know, he was talking about how dark the sense of humour is with the police. And that, again, it's a coping strategy to offset, I guess, all the heavy stuff. And like you said, it's done at appropriate time. Yeah. And being in paediatrics, I try to actually incorporate our patients where we can. I had a little kid who was recovering really nicely from surgery and he was getting restless in his room. And so I said, you know, let's go take a walk around the unit. His mom you know, came with us and they put a little saline syringe in his hand and just told him to squirt people at different uh, nursing stations (laughs) as he saw fit. (laughs) We just sprayed coworkers as we walked around. It was great. (laughs) If there was a scale one to 10 with one end being the loss of life and the other end being fit and well and leaving the hospital, you know, I imagine that you spend most of your time and most of the patients around the end near loss of life. Do you get to celebrate often good stories of recovery and against all odds, you know, this child is now doing well? Do you get to see that side of things because you're in intensive care? That's a great question. I I would say, so there, there are sort of layers of that. Um, there are some patients who come in, they catch a respiratory virus that sends them through a rough patch, but they do okay. And you kind of know, generally speaking from the beginning, like certain patients, they're going to be okay. So you see those recoveries, but you, you never quite worry about them as intensely as you do other patients from the get-go. So there are those recoveries that we see and we're like, oh, we knew they were going to be okay. There are some patients where they recover in their stability enough to not need ICU care, but they're still fighting a lot of um, or dealing with a lot of chronic long-term health care issues. And so while we might be able to transfer them out of the floor and say, okay, well, you got through this one bad infection, but we also recognize you're going to be dealing with cancer still for you know, many years to come. So there's that kind of recovery. And then there are patients where just against all odds, you know, you just thought all the brightest minds in the unit just thought there's just no way. There's just no way. And then they somehow pull through and you just stand there with your jaw on the floor thinking oh my gosh this is incredible and they sometimes their parents are kind enough to send us um, 
pictures or, you know, updates or videos from home and say, thank you so much for helping us through that and look how they're doing now. Um, and I was even lucky enough to have one patient who um, had suffered a pretty severe neurological injury. And we weren't really sure which way this was going to go, whether the patient was going to be paralyzed for life or what have you. But this patient made um, really, really impressive progress. And a few of us were actually able to visit the patient in rehab and met him in the gym when he was, you know, recovering. And we also never would have imagined that he would have recovered so, so beautifully. So those, oh, those stories are just such a gift to us. We come across people who have different ways of talking about death and language seems quite important for a lot of people some people do use the d word some people don't use the d word and everyone we've spoken to has had quite different stipulations on how they like to talk about it either on the podcast or just in life do you find that language is easier around death because you work around it are you working with people who find it quite easy to talk about or is it different because it's a medical sense oh, that's a great question because i'm realizing that we still even in our context still use a lot of the euphemisms of, oh, they they passed away or we lost so-and-so or so-and-so gained their wings. For some reason, I think we still have a hard time just saying, this patient died. And I, I don't know if it's a pediatric thing where you're just trying so hard to gently help the parents land or sink into the reality of this. I think we still have a hard time getting away from a lot of those those euphemisms. When it comes to communicating with the parents, I think that the physicians are straightforward and honest in using the word death. We don't think your child will live, you know, or we think they could die in the next day or two. They'll be straightforward with the parents, but I think that when we talk amongst ourselves, for as much as we see death and dying, we still have a hard time saying like, oh, what happened to such and such patient? Oh, they died. I think we still say, oh, so-and-so passed away. I've heard you talk on your TED Talk about grief being a teacher and how you've learned a lot. Um, just talk a little bit about how you got to that point, because that's a really interesting concept that you've seen grief as a teacher and that it's not all bad either. Grief isn't this big evil presence, but also that you said it was natural. It's a natural process. So... Yeah, tell us a little bit about how you came to that conclusion. Yeah, I very quickly have realized what a grief-averse society we live in. And I think when I would tell people, oh, I, I work in the pediatric ICU and my work is so meaningful because I learn so much about life and love and community. But all people seem to hear is, oh, you just work in this really sad environment. And that just seems so hard. It just seems like it would be so life sucking and it would just take everything out of you. And I just, it just seems so hard. And it is hard, but I think there would always be this part of me that would think, yes, it's hard, but it's so rich and so beautiful and so meaningful in um, the things about life that get brought to the surface so quickly when you are faced with your vulnerability and you are faced with a lot of the big life questions of how do we find hope? How do we learn to love each other when all the external contributors to what we thought would, was a good life seem to have been stripped away. And we're here in this hospital bed and we don't have our life as we know it. We don't even know if we have our future as we want it. But still, how do we find life and love and meaning and connection in the face of all of this, everything else has been stripped away. I don't have my lovely home. I don't have all the good foods that I would love to be eating. I don't have all, all those external things. But does that mean I'm left with nothing? You know, I, and, and I see these parents and their children and my colleagues to dig in so deep to say there's still a hope to be found. There's still meaning to be found because I'm with my child here and we may not have tomorrow, but I have them here. And what does it look like for me to love my child even right here, right now? I think that in, in understanding how grief teaches us that 
the real substance of our life isn't really about every day just being carefree and external. It's just not because that's not going to be guaranteed for any of us all the days of our lives. Whether you end up in a hospital room or just you're dealing with this or that at home, all the pieces that we think would make for a perfect life just aren't going to be there. So when we learn to live without or when those things are stripped away from us and we start to grieve all these other external things, you're really just pushed into like the real meat of what is life about? You know, who am I to my children and and how do I be present to them? Chris, going back to what you had asked earlier of, you know, does doing this work teach you about sort of anticipating things? You know, it's not this like, oh my gosh, every day I'm worried about my children getting hit by a car. I do live with a little bit of paranoia, that's for sure. (laughs) But I think it's learning that I want to live a life that builds a foundation that's set on rock and not on sand because storms will come. And that's just a reality of life. Like storms and grief are going to come. And so what am I building my life on now? If I don't have that foundation, then when the storm comes, if I haven't already learned what I'm standing on, (laughs) and if it's strong enough, being in the thick of crisis is going to be a really, really hard time to try to establish that. You've mentioned a few times throughout our conversation the word hope and whether that's questioning, you know, can hope be found or searching for it yourself? Can hope be found in every type of loss that you encounter? The breadth of my patients' experiences is so wide and I want to honour the reality that it feels sometimes almost dismissive to look at my patients and their parents and say, oh, hope can be everywhere, you know, because uh, their their experiences are just so, so broad (laughs) and their losses are so great. Their suffering is, is great. But where I see hope still as a, a thread that sort of runs throughout all of these cases is a few places. I see it when, even as the parents grieve their children and grieve the suffering and all that is before them, when the parents are able to find these moments of space of still, I'm, I'm going to be here and I'm going to look at how to best love and find ways to comfort my child and advocate for my child. There's a real deep intimacy that comes between the parents and their children, you know, in those moments. I think a lot of the hope can be found in even just the presence of, I don't mean this to be self-aggrandizing, but the presence of the healthcare workers, of the fact that There are people who are willing to come into these spaces every day, as hard as this work is, and say, you're not going to go through this alone. That there will be people who will show up to you and come around you and do everything we can uh, to carry you through these crises in your life. That there's a hope that comes with community and presence even if we can't fix things, that we will be here. You will not be alone in this. And then I think for me personally, there is uh, just my own personal faith. And I look at the story of God and who Jesus is and knowing that God is one who was not averse to our suffering, that he stepped into it, that he knows it intimately, he lived it, he died but he overcame it as well, um, that he was in all those aspects of deep suffering and loss and grief. Um, That for me, that gives me tremendous hope that this is not the end. All the suffering we see, all the breadth of suffering we see, that this is not the end of the story. And I think that's just, it's incredible. It makes me think back over previous guests and almost all of them have got a story of somebody who did something and it might have been something just as tiny as sitting with them that helped them on that grief journey and, you know, help them get to the next level. 
and, and doing something and being there is huge. It's not self-promoting in any way, um, because I think that is such such a key role that you play and other people can play that just by being a good friend. And one of the things that I heard you say somewhere else, I was in the kitchen when I heard it and I was like, oh, that is amazing, was your friend who you messaged to say you weren't sure if you could come for coffee because you were having a really tough time with the grief of a patient. Just tell us what her response was in your words. Yeah, I texted this friend and said, I'm having a rough time with work and I'm not sure if I can meet for coffee. I'm a little bit of a mess right now. We can postpone. And I expected her to just say, sure, I'll give you space. Let's just postpone. And instead, she messaged me back and said, you don't have to protect me from your grief. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm not alone. (laughs) I don't have to pretend. I don't have to even in some ways take care of another person like I can I can be taken care of today and that was a real gift even without knowing it we do that with people we feel like we have to protect them from what we're going through because we don't want to put it on somebody else so for someone to give you permission to say don't protect me I can look after me you be who you need to be you do what you need to do and I'll be there for it I just thought that was just perfect well done friend (laughs) whoever you are well done (laughs) (laughs) How have you got on with the why question? Because I think, you know, the why question is huge in the world in general. Why do people suffer? But why do children suffer is an even bigger question, I think, for a lot of people. Have you grappled with that? I have. I have asked it. I don't necessarily actually expect an answer. I think I have asked it more as a form of just lament and grieving. I I think a lot about this. There's a line from this singer songwriter. um, His name is Rich Mullins. There's just one line from this song where he said, and it wouldn't hurt any less, even if it could be explained. And I think that's such a true statement. I'm not sure that an explanation is going to actually be the balm at the end of the day. And as for the actual question, why I, I just think about, you know, sun shines on the good and evil of the world and rain comes to the good and evil of the world and suffering just befalls all of us in different ways, shapes and forms. And, you know, you might have a nine-year-old child who is in the hospital and is battling a new diagnosis of cancer, but their parents are very deeply present and loving them and helping them to feel comforted and secure and not alone, um, even as they go through that. And then you might have a nine-year-old out and about in the world who's healthy, but maybe their parents are completely negligent. And, you know, there, there are so many different forms of suffering, I think, that come upon all of us. And that much more, I think it just speaks to the why may not be really the question at the end of the day it might just be how do I live and love now where I am in whatever form of suffering I have now or will have tomorrow or a month from now how am I going to live what's my foundation going to be what would you say to somebody who's fairly new maybe in this as a job or career and is just really struggling with this side of it of, of the grief and what to do with it what would your advice be having done it for the last 12 years I'm a really big advocate of just being very, very honest with where we are. I think that a lot of people still look for forms of coping that just would help them escape. And ultimately, it just becomes, well, then my escape has to be leaving the job, right? Like if I'm working this job and I think that I just need to escape all the feelings and I can't escape the feelings because all these stories come to us shift after shift and month after month, year after year, then eventually people say, well, then the only way I can escape is to leave the job or sometimes personally something, you know, a little bit darker or worse. You know, there there are issues of suicide in healthcare professionals, that's a real thing. And I, I, I just, I think that it's really important for us to not just look for escape, but to honestly tackle head on um, the reality of us being human in this work and giving space for our humanity, whether that's through feeling our feelings, looking for therapy, finding ways to honestly work out Um, what this work is doing to you rather than I'll just have another drink or I'll just quit tomorrow. You know, I think there are more human ways for us to take care of ourselves. 
And it would be remiss of us to not be able to offer a flavour of some of the, the brilliant things, the things you love the most about the role as well. So what, what are some of the experiences you get at work that just bring you joy and just, you know, make you fly? I think certainly... Uh, certainly seeing the patients that do get to recover um, after very, very long, hard roads, those make it worth it all at the end of the day. I marvel at the teamwork. I marvel at the family that I have and my coworkers where we all, it's like, you know, when you go through something really, really hard with a consistent group of people over a long period of time, and you just build such a deep camaraderie and understanding with each other of I know the depths of where you've been and we have a rhythm with each other where you just look at each other, you know what you're feeling, you know what people need. And there's a very, very special sense of community that is really irreplaceable to me. I think also the privilege really of being present with these families when we can't uh, make everything better, but they're so grateful for our presence. And it reminds me that it still matters that we show up, even if we can't fix things. For you yourself in your role, if you were to multiply something that you've nurtured and grown that's been really healthy and you can multiply it and give it out to others to take on and grow, ultimately I'm asking, what's your Herman? I would say it is the courage to go deep with the hard questions and to to trust that as we go deep with a lot of our hard questions in life, that there are treasures and answers that can be found, that it's not going to take you down this spiral of increasing despair, but that as we move past the superficial and just have the courage to dig deep, that that's where you build a foundation of rock and you sweep away the sand that you've been standing on and you find that Oh yeah, I went deep and I found a foundation. And then when storms come, you've done the hard work of laying down that foundation and there's a different kind of steadfastness and peace that can be found even when it's still a storm. It's The storm is very real still, but there's a foundation that you have. And I think that just comes with that courage of going deep. How many of us hear a call to go deep and run a mile? Or maybe you feel like it's a challenge that you want to run towards. A challenge that you'll truly value. It's not easy, but it's always worth it. We really enjoyed our conversation with Hui Wen and appreciated the beautiful wisdom and insight that she shared. Thank you, Hui Wen. You can keep receiving what she has to offer through her social media channels and blog. We'll put links in our show notes to her social media and her TED Talk. But you can also read her beautiful writing online at heartofnursing.blog. And if you follow her on Instagram, you get to see her tortoises. As for us at the Silent Y HQ, we'd really appreciate you taking just a few moments to rate or review us on your podcast provider, particularly if you're listening to us through Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Good Pods. A moment of your time will help us into the future. You'll find out more about us and our podcast at thesilentwhy.com, as well as on our social media channels at the Silent Y Pod. After Wei Wen referred to the poem that she'd read about the nurse that witnessed an emergency and subsequent death, and she mentioned that she was struck by the closing line that connected with her and that pull that some people have towards those sorts of situations, I just had to go and find it. It is a dramatic scene that is powerfully portrayed in this poem, so I did think twice about reading it, but then there just didn't seem to be anything else that fit her work so perfectly, and it is so well written. So here it is. Surgical Rotation by Courtney Davis. He was the first. First death. First cold palm on my heart. Hand of frost, pulse of fear. He was only thirty-five. His wife waiting in the family area. He was in for a nothing surgery. Bunyan, of all things. Nobby growth, not cancer, not tumour. The anaesthesiologist gave him the sleepy juice. The patient went out easy. Surgery progressed. Skin cut. Bone rasp snips and grinding. Nothing. Then the gas man gave a little, uh, and the surgeon looked up. We all looked up, BP tanking, then the storm dam burst. Bued panic like ice, circulating nurse, she hit the button and all hell broke. Docks and residents running. Me, flat against the wall, held breath. Bam, bam, code, cart, sparks and the flash of needles. Blood stink, names of meds in my ears like static, like shining wires screeching. Then absolute hush. Blank eyes. Death like a building fell. Death dust rose and settled. 
everything quiet and gritty. Everyone with their particular duty. Nurses here. They're the senior resident given the task. Long walk to the waiting room. Speaking the wife's name in his Bombay lilt. Her scream shot all the way back to OR3, where I stood struck dumb. Enthralled. All of me bright with this hard desire. Let this be. Let this be. Let this be my life's work. Thank you.